Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the CRISP speaker series on privacy. It's our great pleasure to have Laurie Faith Craner. Uh, I've known Laurie for, we worked out probably about 20 years now. Um, it's been a while. Uh, I'm really glad that uh, she's visiting to give a talk. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here in person, obviously, because we're not open yet, but uh, we're glad she could uh, make it at least virtually. So Laurie, uh, uh, is the director of SciLab at Carnegie Mellon University, and she is a fellow of uh, the ACM, the IEEE, AAAS. Um, she was the um, chief, uh, chief technologist at the US Federal Trade Commission. And uh, very interestingly, and I'll uh, let her talk a little more about this, she just uh, launched a new uh, collaboratory against hate that uh, sounds very interesting. So. I'll turn it over to Lori. Thank you. Uh, it's really great to be here, even if it's only virtually. Um, yeah, as Ian mentioned, um, we just started the Collaboratory Against Hate Research and Action Center, which is a joint uh, effort between Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh, which is right down the street from us. Uh, and the idea is to bring together uh, researchers from a wide range of disciplines to work together to do research that will result in um, interventions to uh, reduce extremist hate and violence. And uh, so we've, we've uh, only launched just two months ago and um, are still kind of figuring out what we're doing. Um, but we have um, started by inventorying the interest at the two universities and have collected <clears throat> um, about 300 uh, faculty and researchers who are interested in participating. And it's been really interesting to see, um, you know, I was familiar with people, you know, in computer science and computational areas that were doing things like automatic hate speech detection and things like that. But we also have people in the English department who study um, linguistics and how speech evolves over time, and in particular, how hate speech evolves over time. And you know, if we can get those people to collaborate with the computational people, I think there's a lot more that, that they'll be able to do. Um, we're also working with uh, people at the law school at Pitt, um, adolescent psychologists uh, in their medical school, um, and, and just a wide variety of, of different, different types of disciplines, and then partnering with community groups. So that's, um, that's, that's what we're, we're doing. I see a question, um, to, is this for tackling strictly online social media hate? Um, no, we are looking at the entire pipeline um, which often starts offline. Um, a lot is happening online these days. Um, and then um, the hate when it turns to violence uh, often then becomes an offline uh, issue. Um, we are not uh, specifically worried about definitions of hate per se. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, focused on um, on the, the research aspects of it. And, you know, it would be applicable uh, regard, regardless of, um, of the specific definition of hate that you want to adopt. Um, all right, so anyway, that's, that's a, a little background on something I'm doing right now. Um, also, I'll mention that um, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, I uh, direct uh, um, our privacy engineering master's program um, with my colleague Norman Sade. Uh, so uh, we are always looking for aspiring privacy engineers who would like to, to come see us. And, um, and then uh, I also advise PhD students in a variety of programs, but mostly in societal computing, uh, which is an interdisciplinary program in our School of Computer Science. So, all right, let me jump into the actual topic of this talk, which is about designing usable and useful privacy interfaces. So, about um, it 13 years ago now, um, I worked on a project with my student at the time, Alicia McDonald, who, who's now on our faculty. Um, and uh, she was wondering how long it would take people to actually read all the privacy policies for all the websites they visit. Um, and besides just being ridiculous, like it will never happen, um, 
it, it is it is an interesting question uh, to examine. And Alicia went and gathered a lot of data um, about how many words were in privacy policies, how many different websites people visit, uh, the average adult reading speed. And she came up with this kind of back of the envelope calculation that it would take us all 244 hours per year to read all these privacy policies. Now, I personally spend a lot of time reading privacy policies, but I don't think I spend that much time reading privacy policies. And this basically shows that the notion that if we all have to read privacy policies in order to protect our privacy, um, this is just ridiculous. Like we are not gonna have any privacy if, if it requires that we read all these privacy policies. And you know, if you look at privacy policies, you, you can see why this is a problem because you know, they're, they're long and, and they're very text heavy. Um, and you know, we're not the only ones who have been saying this. Um, back in 2014, there was a White House report um, where they referred to this as a fantasy world that people would read the, these notices before they click consent. Um, and this is all about privacy policies on websites. Um, what happens when we start looking at IoT devices, which are collecting our data, but you know, this uh, smart thermostat doesn't really even have space to display a privacy policy. It's smart light bulbs um, or you know, the drone flying overhead, are we supposed to you know, watch the drone and stop it and, and try to get its privacy policy? Um, this just doesn't really seem very realistic. So uh, we've been looking in my lab about at, at the question of how we can actually put people in control over their personal information, uh, given all of these problems. Right. So uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about traditional privacy policies and going beyond traditional privacy policies. Um, we'll talk specifically about IoT. Um, we'll talk about research on privacy choices for websites and some work we did on developing a privacy icon for the state of California. Okay, so um, when we think about traditional privacy policies, uh, you know, that's all the text and, you know, there, you access them through the link, the bottom of the web page normally. Um, but there are a lot of other places and forms that you can put privacy notice. Uh, so a few, a few years ago, um, a group of us put together this privacy notice design space, and we looked at issues of, you know, when do we display privacy notices? Uh, is it, you know, at setup for a new device or visiting a new website? Is it, you know, just just in time before the data is being collected. And then maybe we don't give you the whole policy. We just give you the information that's relevant to the data that is being collected at that moment. Um, maybe it's context dependent. Maybe you get periodic notices. Uh, maybe it's the icon that's in the corner of your screen at all times, or the, the uh, light that comes on on your camera to show that it's recording. Um, we may see privacy information on our primary device, but if our device doesn't have a screen, maybe we have a secondary device like our phone, which we may be using to control the device, and we could also see the privacy information. Um, or maybe we see this publicly because there are cameras mounted in a room and there's a notice that's actually you know, taped to the wall. Um, we may see things visually, we may have auditory notices, like when we call and, um, and we hear, you know, this, this call is being recorded, uh, haptic, things may vibrate, um, or maybe machine readable. Um, and we may see notices that actually block us, you know, we can't move on until we make a decision, um, or it may be decoupled from the interaction. So a big design space here. And then if we start looking at what people are doing to try to convey notice is in alternative ways, um, we see uh, a few different approaches, uh, lots of videos. There are a lot of websites that now have at least parts of their privacy notice available through a video. Uh, occasionally we see th things like interactive games, um, which I think is a super cute idea, um, but I haven't actually seen one that I think uh, displays the privacy information effectively though. Uh, we're seeing lots of icons, um, and some of these are more effective than others. A lot of them are really not very effective either. 
Now, the, the problem that we find uh, with a lot of these icons is that um, there's, there's a number of different privacy concepts that we're trying to convey. And these are very subtle. These are not very um, physically tangible. And so trying to come up with meaningful icons to explain these things is actually pretty difficult. And there are some pretty good designers who've tried their hand at this. And at the end of the day, you kind of need the words next to the icons. Now, you all probably can see these icons and you probably can't read all of these words. And um, you know, that makes the, the icons kind of kind of mysterious. And, and in contexts where I've seen uh, privacy icons displayed without words, um, they are just that, you know, completely mysterious. We've also looked at the idea of using a nutrition label kind of approach uh, to displaying privacy information. What about Apple's app privacy nutrition labels? Yes, I will get to that in a few minutes. Um, so, um, we, we did this work um, on uh, website privacy labels um, about 10 years ago. Um, and the, these labels, the idea here is down the left side, you have um, different types of data that are being collected. And across the top, you have different uses of data. And then we use color and in particular, the, the darkness of the color to show uh, how much data is being collected. And um, this is a way that you can really see at a glance the types of data practices that a company has. And you can look at two companies side by side and, and see which one is collecting and using more information. Um, so this was something that we developed through an iterative design process. We did lots of testing um, and it, it, uh, was, it, it worked out pretty well um, with, with end users. Um, we also um, uh, developed a, a backend for, for this that was machine readable um, and uh, used an old and now obsolete standard called P3P uh, that you could use to, to generate these, these privacy policies. Um, but once you have it in a machine readable form, it allows you to do a lot of interesting things with that data. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, in the United States, uh, most US banks have a standardized format for their privacy policies. And once a year with your bank statement, you get something that looks like this. Um, so these are two different banks and the format is basically the same. They can use whatever colors they want and they tend to use whatever the color scheme is for, for their bank. And there's a table with some questions and it says yes and no. Um, and uh, this actually is a pretty nice standardized format. Uh, it's not perfect. And we wrote a whole paper on all the things that were wrong with it. But overall, the nice thing is that we can easily put these policies from different banks side by side and compare them. Um, it would be even better if they were computer readable. The, <clears throat> these are published on websites usually in PDF format. And so my students uh, wrote a crawler that went and looked for these and screen scraped them and parsed them and put them all in a database. Um, it's not perfect because uh, there's, there's a lot of bugginess. There, there are some PDFs that do weird things. Sometimes they put the rows in the wrong order, things like that. Um, we did the best we could with it though. Um, and we uh, put together this website where you could search uh, find banks in your zip code and look for banks that met certain privacy criteria. Uh, you can put them side by side and, and, um, and see which ones have the best privacy policies. Uh, we're not maintaining it anymore, but we have, we have the snapshot that we took a few years ago up there so that people can get the idea of you know, what you can do when you take this privacy information and put it in a standard format. Uh, we've also been looking at the problem that a lot of websites have things that you can opt out of, um, but finding those opt outs is fairly difficult. And so we built this plug at, plugin called op, Opt Out Easy. And basically what it's doing is it's parsing all of the privacy information on the website, looking for the opt outs, trying to figure out what kinds of opt outs they are. Are you opting out of marketing email, opting out of tracking? Um, and then uh, you, can, you can click on a button um, in the browser plugin that uh, will give you a list of the opt outs available on the website you're visiting and will take you to those opt outs. 
unfortunately, because this isn't standardized, it's not automated. So I can't just click a button and say, opt me out of everything, but at least it will take me right to the place on the website where the opt outs are located. Okay, so there are a variety of different types of privacy interfaces that we're interested in. Um, so the privacy notices and icons that we talked about, um, there are also consent interfaces. And so these may pop up and say, hey, uh, before you proceed, you have to give us consent to collect or use certain types of data. Um, or they may be things that you can go back to later and say, hey, I'd like to give consent or I'd like to revoke consent uh, to something um, that I provided for uh, uh, previously. Um, and then that's sort of blurring into privacy settings, uh, which are designed to, to allow you to, to indicate what, what uses of, of your data are acceptable. And then there are privacy dashboards, which tend to have privacy settings, but also uh, some visibility into what information has already been collected about you. So we have all these different types of privacy interfaces. And um, the, the interest in my group is largely on the usability. Are these things actually useful to anybody? Um, and so what criteria should we use to evaluate them? So let's focus on the privacy notices uh, that we see. Um, so uh, one question that we have is whether anybody actually can find the notice. Do they notice the notice? Um, Assuming that people are able to find it, do they actually stop and read it? Um, if they do, do they understand what it means? Uh, likewise, if they see icons, do they understand what the icons mean? Um, do they find the information useful? Does it actually answer the questions they have? And does it impact their decision or behavior? Um, and so by impact, what I mean is that if somebody reads a privacy notice, does it give them the information to decide that yes, I feel comfortable with this use of my data and I'm gonna proceed or no, I don't and I'm going to take some other course of action. Um, and so uh, ultimately that, that is, in some ways the real test is we wanna see whether people can actually make use of this information. When I was at the Federal Trade Commission, um, we um, held a workshop called Putting Disclosures to the Test. And we went beyond just privacy notices and talked about all different kinds of disclosures, uh, including uh, actual food nutrition labels, drug fact labels, um, labels on uh, energy efficiency, on appliances and light bulbs. And we brought in experts and we asked them, how do you know if these notices and labels and disclosures are any good? And it was interesting hearing these researchers in lots of different fields who hadn't previously even talked to each other, but they were all taking basically the same sort of approaches and they all had very similar advice. So, you know, really key thing is everybody said, well, you really have to do a test. You can't just look at it and know whether this is going to be an effective privacy notice or any kind of notice. Um, you have to test. And even if you don't have much of a budget for it, you know, some testing is usually better than no testing. Um, and then they also mentioned the importance of testing comprehension in context. So it's not enough to just show people a notice or a label and say, hey, does this make sense to you? But really you should give them a decision and have them look at the notice and see if they can use it to make an informed decision. Okay, so um, one of the evaluation studies um, that we did about 10 years ago at CMU, um, was with a uh, privacy, privacy um, um, meters in a search engine. So we had this idea that we could label search results with how good their privacy policy was using this whole automated protocol and P3P, that obsolete um, uh, standard. But um, we had this idea that if we put these privacy uh, meters in search engines, it would help people find websites with better privacy. Um, that was the idea, but would this actually work? Would, would people actually pay attention to this and change where, where they clicked based on, these, um, based on these privacy meters? So we did a series of studies. Um, I'm just gonna tell you about one of them here. Um, we implemented this uh, privacy finder search engine 
And we invited 72 people to our lab one at a time uh, to use the search engine. And um, we didn't tell them that it was called Privacy Finder. We actually changed it to Shopping Finder so that we wouldn't prime them about privacy. Um, half of the people saw uh, the privacy meter and others were in other conditions. And actually, uh, yeah, I'll show you in a minute what those other conditions look like. Um, but the way we, we uh, ran the study was that we asked people to search for and, and purchase two items. And we gave them a budget and we said that uh, they could keep the change. Um, so there was an incentive for them to find low price items um, so that they would have more, more money uh, to keep. Okay, so the two items uh, we had them purchase, one of them was a, um, a pack of Duracell batteries. And um, everything here was real. These were real merchants, real money. People had to use their real credit cards. Uh, the only thing that we controlled and kind of faked here was that we always returned exactly the same search results um, when they ran their search. And we, uh, we fixed the results so that the first four merchants um, matched a particular set of criteria. Uh, we had three conditions. In one condition, uh, they saw the privacy meter. In another condition, they saw a meter that was labeled handicapped accessibility, which was something we pre-tested and found that most people didn't actually care about when making purchase decisions. And then the third um, uh, condition, they did not see any meter. Um, but they saw the same search results. And we set it up so that the first website that they saw had the worst privacy and the fourth one had the best privacy. The first one had the lowest price and the fourth one had the highest price. So um, our hypothesis was that if people uh, were in the no information condition with no meter and, and also if they were in the handicapped accessibility condition, um, that they would purchase from the first website because it was cheapest, it was first, most people just click the first link and don't scroll. Um, there would be no reason to go anywhere else. But on the other hand, if they had the privacy information, our hypothesis was that they would actually go down to that fourth website, which had the best privacy, even though it cost a little bit more. Um, I think it was about 65 cents more. And what we found um, was that in fact, this was true. Um, and um, uh, we also tested a more privacy sensitive purchase, uh, which was a sex toy. The first time we ran the study, uh, we actually didn't find a difference between the battery purchases and the sex toy purchases, uh, but uh, we realized that um, we had different price ranges, different prices. These were real websites, our prices were changing, and we hadn't controlled things well enough. So we actually had to repeat the study, and this time we actually called all the vendors and told them we were using their, their websites as part of our study. We asked them to hold their price at certain, certain rates. Um, and once we had controlled for everything, we found, in fact, that there was a larger effect for privacy sensitive purchases. Okay, so um, another uh, area we looked at was putting privacy information in the app store. So in this case, this was in the Android app store. Um, we made a mock-up of the Android app store in which there was a privacy facts label uh, for every app. And then um, we wanted to test this. Now, of course, we, we didn't have this in the real app store. So again, you know, we used the mock-up. Um, we invited people into our lab and um, we, we told them that they were gonna be using our new app store uh, to try things out. Um, half the people saw um, the app store that looked pretty much identical to the real app store and half of them saw the app store with privacy facts. And we mocked up um, a bunch of apps to have the privacy facts label. And then we gave people the scenario that they had a friend who had just gotten their first Android phone and wanted some assistance in selecting some apps. And they wanted uh, an app to, in each of several categories. They wanted a diet app, they wanted a word game, um, a travel app, et cetera. And what we found was when people were you know, helping their friends select apps without the privacy information, they never really mentioned privacy. They kind of went through and they said, oh, well, this one has a better rating. This one looks more fun. Um, when we gave them privacy facts, all of a sudden that became something that they started using. And a lot of people would choose the app with better privacy, but not always. Uh, we found that if they were choosing between two apps and one of them, they were familiar with the brand, 
um, they would likely choose that regardless of privacy. Um, also, sometimes if they were choosing, and one of them was very highly rated, even if it had bad privacy, again, they would choose that. Um, so what we found is privacy is not everything, but when you give that privacy information, it is something that people will use as part of their decision process. Right, so this is work that we did back in um, 2011 and 2012, and uh, you know, fast forward, uh, almost 10 years, and Apple announced that they would require apps to, um, to have privacy nutrition labels. And we've heard that they, were, um, that they were somewhat influenced by our paper 10 years earlier on this idea. So those have just rolled out um, recently, um, and they are, of course, not perfect. Um, and I'm hoping that, that Apple will um, refine them over time to make them better. Uh, but they really are a good step, I think, in the right direction. And it's great to see the idea of nutrition labels being used um, in the App Store. Uh, I just taught my usable privacy and security class at CMU this, this past spring. And um, we do class projects. And so I did have a class project team that did a user study on the Apple app nutrition labels. And, um, and they found that overall people did like them and people were able to use them, but there were definitely some sections that just completely confused people um, and, and could, could use some improvement. So we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. Let's see, question. Can companies' mandatory GDPR disclosures be transformed in an automated fashion into more granular privacy nutrition label information? Um, so there, there have been a number of efforts to try to automatically parse uh, privacy notices and GDPR disclosures and things like that. Um, and there, there has been some success in, in doing that. Uh, definitely not 100% uh, success because companies are still using very different language um, to, to do this and, and there's just not enough consistency. Uh, but but there, there is some ability to parse not only GDPR but, but basically the whole, whole privacy notice. Um, and there's a few, few different tools. So there, there's one uh, that my colleagues at CMU did. I think there's one at University of Michigan. There's a few, few others um, out there. Um, so, uh, so I guess the answer is sort of. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, but that, that uh, leads into uh, my next point, which is that we can do more with automation. And it would be really nice to see more use of metadata and machine readable policies in the privacy space. Um, because once we have policies that are standardized and machine readable, then there's all sorts of tools that we can build for auditing, for uh, compiling information, but also user facing tools like search engines um, and you know, browser plugins and apps and stuff that become much easier once you have um, the metadata uh, so, that, so that you can you can just consume that metadata and you don't have to go and screen scrape and, and try to you know, do natural language processing on, on complicated and, and fuzzy text and, and things like that. Um, plus, if you have things standardized, um, it, it's also easier for, for the humans because things are much more consistent. Okay, so let's take a look at IoT. Um, as I mentioned, uh, IoT devices are problematic for um, displaying privacy policies because they're small and they don't really have enough room to do it, but they're also pervasive. They're everywhere. And um, you, know, you, you, you don't really wanna have to be like constantly looking for privacy policies as you walk through physical space. So um, it has been suggested that maybe what you could do instead is just have these things like beep or blink when they collect data. So at least you would know what was collecting data and maybe you like avoid it or something. Um, but given the number of devices that we have already and are anticipated having in the future, uh, this could be quite the cacophony of blinky, beepy things all over the place. Um, it's gonna give everybody a headache. Um, so this doesn't seem like a scalable solution, although there, there's certainly some context, you know, it, it makes sense to have that light, the recording light on the camera. And, you know, there are definitely some contexts where this makes a lot of sense, but not to rely on this at scale for every IoT device. So um, 
at CMU, we've been looking at the idea of a personal privacy assistant. And the idea is this would be software that would run on your smartphone or your smartwatch. And it would be looking for these IoT devices that should be broadcasting information about their data practices. Um, and so, you know, your, your personal assistant is listening, it finds out, you come into a room, it finds out, okay, there are like 10 IoT devices here. It, um, it queries them to find out what their data they're collecting, what they're going to do with it, who they're going to share it with, all that good stuff. And then um, the devices will look to your personal preferences, your settings, and see whether there's anything um, problematic there. Um, so it may be that I say, you know, if there are smart light bulbs and all they're finding out is that someone is in the room, someone is not in the room, they have no, no idea it's me. Well, I don't care. Like they can just do their little light bulb thing. It doesn't bother me. Um, smart thermostats doesn't bother me. But if I walk into a room and my voice is going to be recorded, well, I want to know that. Um, and so we can have the personal assistant know when it should interrupt me and let me know about data collection. Um, it may also be the case that I say, hey, I've been in this room every day and I know there's data collection in this room. You can stop telling me about this room. If I go into a new room, you should tell me, but this room, it's okay, don't bother me anymore. Um, so we've been doing research on what exactly people wanna be notified about and, and how we can make all this work. Um, we have a, uh, a prototype um, on campus at CMU. Um, well, I guess we haven't really been on campus for the past year, but, but uh, the pieces are there. Um, uh, so we, we basically have an app where as you walk around campus, you can see if you're in the vicinity of an IoT device that's collecting data, and then you can drill down if you wanna see the type of data so here, visual data, as I walk through the hallway, I might see this big monitor where you see these like skeleton images superimposed on top of you as, as you see yourself walking down the hall. And you might wonder, what, what is this? It's kind of creepy. And you know, are they recording this? What are they doing with this data? Um, so then I can click further and I can find out um, you know, which laboratory is actually doing this, um, why they're doing it, uh, what information they're collected, and things like that. So uh, we, we have that as a prototype and we actually have a public registry where people all over the world can basically add their IoT devices um, if they want it to be part, part of the system. Okay, another problem with IoT devices and privacy is that um, when we buy an IoT device for our homes, um, it's very difficult to figure out how to buy one that doesn't have the kinds of security and privacy problems that we keep hearing about on the news. You know, I, I, hear, I hear that there are all these problems. Um, and so, you know, when, when I go online to buy my IoT device, I want one of the good ones. It doesn't have these privacy and security problems. Uh, so the problem, though, is that you know, if I go on Amazon to look at these devices, there's all sorts of information about the devices and their Bluetooth connectivity and how much they weigh and all sorts of good stuff, but there's really nothing about privacy and security. So even if I say, well, I'm going to go to an actual store to buy something, um, it's no better. You know, we can look on the, the box that's sitting on the shelf and we can look on all sides of the box and there is still no privacy or security information. Um, and uh, you know, I can go to a different store, I can go to a different brand of device and same problem, no information. You know, the best I've been able to find is that Google devices actually have information on a Google website about the sensors in their devices and the privacy information, which is great, um, but it's not in any sort of standard format, it's not, um, easily accessible to people when they're in that kind of, you know, I'm trying to decide what to purchase mode, um, but this is a step in the right direction. Um, so we started looking at, well, maybe we should have a privacy and security nutrition label for IoT devices. And um, my student, Pardisamami Naini, who's um, now a postdoc at the University of Washington, uh, she did this mock-up 
of what a privacy and security facts label might look like for an IoT device. And she did a set of interviews, um, she talked to people and found there was a lot of enthusiasm from people who have purchased IoT devices. They said they really would have liked to have had this information when they made their purchase. Um, and uh, then she asked them, well, you know, what, what information exactly would you want to have? And they said, well, they aren't experts in security and privacy, so they didn't really know. Um, so then we um, went and talked to experts and asked them, and they gave us like 47 different things that they thought were important. Um, so we continued uh, working on the label. Um, we did more mock-ups, we did more consumer studies. Um, but what, where we landed on was a two-layer label. So what you see on the left is the consumer facing label. Um, and here we focus on just really two pieces of security information. Um, we look at uh, the availability of security updates and we look at access control. That, that's all we're gonna look at for security for consumers. And then for privacy, we look at what sensors are on the device, what data they collect and what they're gonna do with it. And then we have a link and a QR code that can take you to the full detailed information about security and privacy. And here we have a lot more information. Um, we have information about ports and protocols, hardware security, software security, um, lot, lots more information. Um, and uh, this, this is gonna be mostly of interest to experts, but there may be some consumers who, who might be interested in taking a look at this as well. As well. Uh, so anyway, we have all of this up on iotsecurityprivacy.org. There is a wizard you can play with if you'd like to see what it would be like to generate your own label. Um, we have a complete specification and um, we have put this in the public domain in the hopes that it might actually get adopted and that you know, companies can use it. They don't need to license it from us. Um, so far, nobody has adopted it, um, but we, we've started pushing it. And in the United States, um, just, just a couple of weeks ago, the president issued an executive order which um, has requirements for IoT security and privacy, um, including suggesting that the National Institute of Standards and Technology should look into this idea of security labels. Um, so we've started reaching out to people at NIST um, and also some of the um, congressional representatives who are also interested in legislation in this area. So we'll see what happens. Okay, so let's talk a bit about privacy choices on websites. Uh, we did a study a couple of years ago where we um, had our research assistants look at 150 websites um, to find out where their opt-out choices were. And uh, so they would go to the homepage on the website, they would create a user account, they would visit the privacy policy, they'd visit the account settings. And in this whole process, wherever they found something about opting out, they made a note of it and they counted how many clicks or whatever other actions it would take to find it. Um, they also looked at what words were used to describe it, what headings um, there were. Um, we grabbed bits of the privacy policy so we could check the number of words and the reading level, things like that. Um, so we, we looked at 150 websites. We, we took uh, 50 that were very highly ranked websites, um, 50 that were uh, ranked 5,000 or lower, and then 50 that were kind of in the middle. Um, so we don't quite get into the long tail, um, but we do get a range of the popularity of websites. So what we found is that most websites, if they collected data, they did actually have privacy choices. Um, so th that was good to see. Um, and uh, you know, the types of choices they had depended in part on the types of data they were collecting. So you know, if they didn't have targeted advertising, then of course they didn't need to have a choice about targeted advertising. Um, we looked at the reading level of, uh, of the information on these websites, and we found that overall privacy policies are fairly difficult to read. They have about a 10th grade reading level requirement. Um, but when you look at the information in the privacy policy that pertains specifically to opting out, there it requires a university level reading ability. Um, so that those parts of the privacy policy are even more difficult to read than the privacy policy overall. 
Um, we had this idea that maybe if you wanted to find the opt-outs, there maybe were some keywords you could search for to find them. Um, and we looked at the headings of the sections where the opt-outs were. And what we found was there was no dominant wording. Um, so 150 websites, there was no single engram that occurred in more than 20 out of 150 websites um, that, that related to the opt-out section. Um, so we see a lot of inconsistency. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's data subjects rights, sometimes it's your choices, sometimes it's how can I manage or, or delete information. Um, so this seemed kind of problematic. Um, we also see that there are websites that have a lot of choices. This is a snippet on the um, Amazon website. And uh, so these are all the different um, types of emails that you can opt out of. And if you start at the top of that and you see all these blue boxes, you might think you have to go through and uncheck them one at a time. Um, it's not until you scroll to the bottom that you find that there's actually one checkbox that you can use to uncheck them all. And of course, if you don't click that update button in the bottom right, then it doesn't really matter because it won't actually stick. Um, and so th this is uh, problematic. Uh, we also found that there are websites that have links to multiple opt-outs. Um, and so if you go on Twitter and you look in the account settings, there's a link to their Twitter implemented opt-out. And then if you go to their about ads page, there's four different opt-outs. And if you go to their privacy policy, there's two more opt-outs. And you, know, you kind of wonder, like, do I have to opt out of all of these things? What if I only opt out of some of them? Are there things that, you know, do they do the same thing? Do they do different things? It's really not clear. Um, so this was all done with our research assistants who are relatively experts going and trying to find the opt-outs and finding the shortest path they could find to opt out. So we did another study in our lab where we had, you know, random participants off the street come in and we had them go to nine different websites and try to exercise opt-outs. Um, and you can see on this graph, the orange bar was the shortest path and the blue bar was the average for our participants, which you can see is um, substantially longer and more clicks it took them to actually opt out of things. Okay, so um, people have said, well, if we just had privacy icons, it would lead us to all this information on websites. It would make things really simple. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Icons are often not that simple, and they are often confusing to figure out what it is they mean unless you put words next to them. Um, you know, this is um, uh, a set of privacy icons for um, uh, for for an app, and um, yeah, I most most of these are quite quite baffling. Um, you know, I, I love the one. It looks like a kid throwing up their hands. You know, wh what does that mean? Um, so one of the most common icons uh, on the internet today for privacy is this ad choices icon. And we had seen in our studies that most people had no clue what it actually meant, e even though it's like everywhere. And a lot of people recognized having seen it. Um, and we did this study 10 years ago, but I'm pretty sure if we did it today, we would get exactly the same result, and at least anecdotally. And um, we, we did actually test this in our pri California privacy icon study, and, and it, it appears that yeah, people don't understand it. Um, what we did is we showed people an ad with the icon, and then we had different taglines next to it. And um, normally when you see it, if it has any words next to it, the words are ad choices. But sometimes it will say something like, why did I get this ad? Um, so we made a list of the taglines that we had seen, as well as some others that we thought might be better. Um, and so each participant saw one tagline, one icon, one ad. And then we asked them some questions to see what their understanding was. So one question we asked was, what would happen if you clicked on the icon? And then we gave them various choices and, and they had to say whether that was likely or not likely to happen. So 56% of people said it was likely that more ads would pop up and that's completely wrong. 45% uh, thought it was kind of a your ad here thing if you wanted to buy an ad, that's also wrong. Only 27% of the people had the right answer, which was that it will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. 
So that's, that's not really very good. Now, if we switch it up so we don't have ad choices and instead say configure ad preferences, which was something we made up, um, what we find is that people do a lot better. Um, in fact, 50% of the people got the right answer. Now, 50% is still not very good, but it's a lot, a lot better than 27%. Um, so that what this shows is that if you actually put some effort into improving the usability of these privacy icons, uh, you can do better. Um, you know, it, it, this is not our business to you know, redesign the ad industry's icon, um, but you know, the, the ad industry does a lot of fine tuning of their messaging. So you know, I believe that if they actually wanted to improve their messaging, they probably could. All right, and this brings us to the state of California. Um, so they adopted the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and uh, one of the provisions of the CCPA is that, um, uh, th that websites have to have a link to let people um, select, do not sell my personal information. And that optionally, could, there could be a button or logo next to that link to attract people's attention to it. So we wondered what would that button or logo look like? And we reached out to the state attorney general in California and we asked them and they said they were trying to figure it out. So we decided to help them. Um, now they had a 90 day public comment period. So we had 90 days to do this. Um, so it wasn't very much time and that included winter break. Um, so there definitely wasn't much time to do it, but my students were really excited about it and they said, Let, let's go for it. Um, so we did this process that included um, coming up with ideas for icons. We did a preliminary um, evaluation on Amazon Mechanical Turk. We refined it, came up with the most promising icons. Then we tested those. Then we looked at the link text to put next to the icons. Then we did a combo study. And then finally, you know, on the last day of the 90 day comment period, we submitted a report to the attorney general. So our ideation started with, you know, markers and post-it notes, and we just came up with lots of ideas. Um, we had uh, some design students go through and actually refine these ideas into more sensible looking icons, They're actually pretty attractive looking. Um, and then we also tested the ad industry's icon. So the industry says that if you take that ad choices icon and make it green instead of blue, then it means do not sell my personal information. And we were a little skeptical, but okay, we'll, we'll test that too. Um, so we had 240 participants and we tested um, these icons. And what we learned, first of all, is that when we didn't put words next to them, they were all confusing pretty much. Um, when we added words, um, they, did, they did better. Um, the icon that best conveyed the concept of choices about personal information was this one that looks kind of like a toggle. Um, the one that best conveyed do not sell my personal information was this dollar sign that crossed out. Um, but there were also a lot of misconceptions about it because a lot of people thought it had something to do with payments, not accepting credit cards, things like that. Um, and we found the, these um, opt out icons that were supposed to look like somebody taking something out of a box or a folder, they, they mostly just confused people. Um, and that green icon mostly just confused people. Um, we also had these stop sign icons um, and people didn't realize there were stop signs, maybe because they were black instead of red. So uh, we, went, we, we had our designers add color to these icons and refine them a bit and we tested uh, five uh, refined icons. And um, this time what we found was once again, um, the toggle and the dollar sign seemed most promising, but they, they conveyed different things. Um, yeah, okay. And uh, we also looked at the misconceptions. And what we found is that the toggle was really the only one that didn't have a lot of misconceptions associated with it. I mean, some people were just confused by it, but they didn't, they weren't um, coming away with the wrong thing. Whereas the, um, the industry icon, people thought it was a play button for video content. Um, and the, uh, the slash dollar, uh, people thought it meant something was free or cash wasn't accepted or something like that. Okay, uh, then we looked at taglines. I'm gonna skip 
over this part, um, but the um, the main point is that we identified a set of things um, that um, that looked promising instead of do not sell my personal information. So then we did a study and we took um, kind of the industry icon, the toggle, which we thought looked pretty good, and then the slash dollar, because that was kind of the next best thing. Um, we took five taglines and no tagline, and we tested them all. So each participant saw a website, and we did this fake shoe store website. So everybody saw a fake shoe store website, and at the bottom of the website, they would see an icon and a tagline. Um, and um, what we found uh, was that, again, we still had a lot of misconceptions. Now we even had misconceptions about shoe sizes and things like that because it was on a shoe store website. Um, we found none of the icons were very good without a tagline, um, and the slash dollar was especially bad. Um, uh, and we found that um, you could have the tagline without the icon, and that was fine, um, but the icon still helped draw attention to the taglines. So from all of this, we, rep we recommended to the attorney general that they use the blue toggle icon and put the words privacy options next to it, which seemed the most promising. Um, but since the law actually says you have to say, do not sell my personal information, all right, you could do that too. Um, that was our recommendation. The attorney general read our report and um, came out pretty quickly with what they were, they were proposed regulation. So this is our recommended icon, and this is what they proposed. Um, so it looks kind of like a toggle like ours, but it's red instead of blue. And um, the thing is that ours was designed specifically not to look like a real toggle that you could actually toggle, whereas theirs wasn't. And theirs looks like almost exactly like a real toggle that you could actually toggle. So people were concerned about that. Um, people on Twitter were tweeting lots of funny things about it. Um, so we ran another study um, in time for their next public comment period, which was much shorter. And we tested theirs versus ours and a few variations on it. And um, basically what we found is that the color didn't really make much difference, but the shape of the icon made a huge difference. And there was a lot more confusion about theirs than ours. Um, so this reinforces once again that you really need to test these things. Even a small difference sometimes can make a big difference with users. So the attorney general then removed the icon altogether from the proposed regulation, but they said they'd come back to it. And then they reached out to us and they sent us some more icons and they said, can you test these for us? Pretty please. Um, now these of course were very similar to the ones we'd already tested, but all right, we humored them, we tested them. Um, and um, that required uh, changing our protocol a little bit because they wanted us to do things a little bit differently in this test. Um, they also wanted us to only have people in California in this test. I'm gonna skip over the details here. Um, the bottom line was these new icons were not very good. Um, and in fact, made things worse than not having an icon at all. Uh, so uh, we sent them another report. Six months later, they decided to recommend our blue toggle icon. Yay. Um, so this is now the official uh, privacy options icon uh, in the state of California. Um, and we hope someday in the rest of the United States and maybe even the world, who knows. Um, all right, so let me wrap it up here. Um, many privacy interfaces suffer from usability problems. That's not a surprise. Um, and this is exacerbated by the proliferation of lots of, of IoT devices. Um, standardization is good. We need standardization in both visually, but also behind the scenes, we need machine readable policies and metadata. Um, and then we need to evaluate these um, privacy interfaces to see what actually works with consumers. And I will end it there and take any additional questions that people have. Right, that's time, Flory. You hear my clapping, of course. <laughs> Great. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, you can go ahead and put them in the Q and A um, while we're uh, waiting for questions. I'll just start with one. So uh, you mentioned the IoT uh, security and privacy uh, labels. So I remember that. Um, uh, Consumer Reports has a digital standard that's aiming to do something similar to that. Can you talk about the, uh, the relationship between that? 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, Consumer Reports has started doing security and privacy testing of, of devices of like smart refrigerators and things like that. I'm actually on their advisory board. Um, and uh, as part of that, they haven't yet kind of figured out what to present to consumers. They're, they're looking at the back end, you know, how do we test for it? And so we're actually talking to them about um, uh, presenting some of the information from their tests using either our entire label or at least parts of our label. So that's still a work in progress and we'll see, but, but they, they address different parts of the problem because we're just dealing with the self-reported information. Consumer Reports is actually verifying that it actually does what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just a, another question on that. Um, your your label had a QR code, which presumably someone's supposed to scan and follow the link. That itself, of course, has privacy implications. So uh, how deep does the rabbit hole go? <laughs> very deep, very deep. Um, yeah, it has a QR code. It also has a link. You can type it in yourself. Uh, of course, whenever you scan a QR code, you should always verify that the link matches the the link that that to the legitimate company. But yeah, I, I realize that's potentially an issue. Right. There's a question in the chat. Uh, do you have the in the Q and A? You have the uh, yeah. Uh, all right. What do you think chances are for adoption of the labels? Um, that's a good question. So having been through um, the adoption problem with the P3P web privacy standard um, starting in 2002, so this is like now almost 20 years ago. Um, you know, we put a lot of effort, like seven years worth of effort, into P3P. And it basically just wasn't adopted. Um, so um, I used to be optimistic about these things, and now I'm not, um, having been burnt on that already. Um, that said, um, there's also a lot of evidence that um, uh, P3P was just about 20 years ahead of its time. And we may finally be in a time where people um, understand why having machine readable privacy labels is actually useful. Um, I don't think that industry will spontaneously decide to adopt it though. Uh, I think in order to see it adopted, we're gonna have to have regulation that either uh, mandates it or offers safe harbors to companies that adopt. Let's see, next question. How do these visuals translate to a non weird audience, Western industrialized, whatever. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, we did not test them on a non-weird audience. We, um, the, our, our requirement was to test them only with California residents. So, um, so that, that, that's what we tested them on. Um, and uh, that, that is, it is a great question and, and something that um, would be useful to, to, uh, to test uh, outside of the United States. Okay, we're uh, just out of time. So let's thank Laurie again. Yay. And uh, she'll be moving to the uh, meeting with students next. So if you're a student, you can go over to that room now. Thank you all. Thanks.